So this is the Microsoft Meetup group. Is everyone here exclusively Microsoft in their background? Are there any Java in the background? Uh, C Sharp? Heavy JavaScript front ends? Just here, just to kind of see what this is all about? That's you, Floyd. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Who's here for just the pizza and nothing else? There we go. That's one guy. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I guess my only claim to fame today is I spoke at JSConf in 2014 about writing custom DSLs. And that was very cool, but very scary. I, I, there was like 600 people there. This is much nicer because I can see the eyes of everyone and uh, not quite as nervous, which is good because this talk is nerve wracking. Um, how many people here know what TypeScript is? Good. How many people here know what CoffeeScript is? How many people here have a firm opinion on CoffeeScript and TypeScript? That's right, there we go. Young man, I haven't met you. What is your name? David. David, or did I meet you? David has a strong opinion. I got my eye on you, David. Um, so yeah, so this is, this talk was one of those talks that um, uh, Veritas called me up and said, hey, I know you talk occasionally, would you like to talk? And of course I said, absolutely, I love talking. And uh, they said, we're a Microsoft Meetup group. And I said, I, I don't know anything about Microsoft technologies per se. Um, so, uh, so what, what can I do? So I thought about technologies I did know and what could be interesting. And I said, well, you know, TypeScript is a Microsoft technology technically. So, um, and it is. So I said, that'd be a good one. Uh, so that's how I settled on TypeScript. Uh, because I had to pull some Microsoft technology out of my, out of my butt, uh, that, you know, a lot of people would find interest in. This particular topic is, um, uh, is particularly nasty because, and we'll get into that in the, in the, in the slide deck uh, to follow, because it tends to evoke a lot of opinions and a lot of hostility. Uh, I have reviewers, you know, ICE has a lot of developers there, so I'm able to you know, bounce ideas. I've been in two fights with close colleagues just over talking about what this uh, talk would be about. Um, and the way we sit, there's, there's rows of us. So when I, you know, when I ask someone a question, I say, hey, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about putting this in the talk. Someone who overhears me would stand up. So at some point, you know, there were 12 people who were standing up, you know, saying, no, 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 you can't talk about that. You have to say this, not that. Um, so the, the reason why I thought this talk would be neat is captured in my opening slide. So red line is CoffeeScript, blue line is TypeScript, and yellow line is ES6. Does anyone have an impression as to uh, which one of those is the dominant technology of the future? Yeah, I know you do, David. Got my eye on you. TypeScript and ES6. Clearly, TypeScript and ES6. So the uh, so I talked about this with um, the people today, and we couldn't tell yet whether this was definitely the trend where people are going, or whether there was just a lot of interest caused by uh, TypeScript that was causing people to look at other languages. So. Because there's no clear, oh, by the way, if I were to throw in Google Trends JavaScript up there, it would blow out everything else. So it just so happens that these three technologies, uh, according to Google Trends, are neck and neck, um, and which, I, which is what I find interesting, is that there's, we're at this interesting point where this is actually, you know, in this part of the slide, uh, it's like, what a great time to talk about this. So, let's talk. And this is, uh, so please hold questions to the end. There will be some, especially you, David. There will be some uh, points in this uh, talk where people want to throw things at me, and I don't want you to throw things at me. Um, as a result, there are rules. First, be nice, be respectful, don't throw things. Make no personal offense to anything I'm saying about a programming language. It's a programming language. I'm not saying anything personally against you. Uh, I, there is a lot of content in this slide that I am going to gloss over, which will be aggravating for people who want to know more about any one thing. Um, additionally, there are pieces of content that I am very clear on, and there are others that I'm a bit fuzzy on. The reason why I'm a bit fuzzy in some things has to do with the fact that some of the specs are moving around, so it's not exactly clear, you know, is, you know how does that work? Well, the last I remember, the way it worked was this. So you'll have to... If you see that, I'll, you know, if there's disapproving looks in the audience who are going, mm, that's not correct, then just, just know I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Um, 
So this talk, uh, based upon the, the early reviews of my colleagues, this is a very stressful talk for people, and so I'm going to be monitoring the stress of the room to see if anyone's ready to throw something. Um, to keep everyone uh, under control, we're going to be showing kittens. So randomly throughout the talk, there'll be kittens, which will calm you down. All right, so let's start off with uh, my perspective. The, the, it's important for me to present to you guys my perspective, because everything I'm about to say does fall into the category of my opinion. So if you don't understand what I do, what my background is, it's not going to make any sense. For example, if I were to tell, tell you I was the author of TypeScript, I'm not, then that would color everything I'm saying next. If I was the author of CoffeeScript, that would color everything I'm saying next. So let's set, uh, let's set a baseline here. This is why I think only a crazy person would attempt this talk. By the way, I will be reading a lot of these bullets. I apologize, uh, but I'll be quick. Um, there's no way to do this topic uh, justice in an hour. Uh, I said this, developers are fiercely opinionated. This third bullet, these are two very nasty debates, static versus dynamic and Java versus anything else. Has anyone had the misfortune to be caught in one of these debates in their career? Static versus dynamic typing? Seriously, no one has? You have, there we go. Was it fun? Okay. Uh, Java versus any language, it doesn't matter. Has anyone been caught in one of those debates? Okay, there we go. It's, was that fun? Yeah, no, it's not fun. So people tend to go off the rails very quickly. Um, the fourth bullet point was a complete accident. So I figured Angular, you know, at least I don't have to get into that. You know, like I can just focus on languages and whatnot. And it turns out that right, so I agreed to give this talk with this topic. And then Angular announced, we're going to be doing everything in TypeScript, which now pulled this talk right to the Angular debate, um, which is nasty. So if people want, I have prepared a very short speech, vent, piece of opinion piece, op-ed about Angular versus TypeScript versus React Flow. Does anybody know what any of those technologies are? You've heard of, who's heard of Angular? Okay, good. Who's heard of React? Who's heard of Flow? You may not have. Good. There we go. Um, so if anybody's interested, just let me know during the question and answer. <clears throat> All right, and I to, there's more caveats. You're like, Neil, is there a talk or is it all going to be caveats? Hold on. So I am not a language designer. There are people who do this and think about languages and how languages should be designed, and, you know, I'm not one of those people. I'm not an academic. I'm not going to be giving you my opinion based upon, uh, you know, a theoretical understanding of languages. I'm going to give you my impression as someone who uses languages to make money. Um, I'm not flawless in my memory, <laughs> so please forgive me. Uh, I'm not totally, and this is, this is kind of weird. So any questions that go, oh, how does this compare with, you know, IO or, uh, you know, was it any, pick any language that you're familiar with. Can you compare and contrast? I probably can't. I know some languages, uh, I know others well, so I may not do a good job. If it's a very popular language, I probably do know it, but, but you know, bear with me. Um, and I can't teach you through programming languages. And this is where it's going to get a bit frustrating because just when it gets good, I'm going to move off of a topic and onto another one that there's no way around it. Uh, I think to do this talk really well would take six hours. So I could build up JavaScript, build up ES6, build up TypeScript, build up CoffeeScript, and then begin to go feature by feature by feature explaining you know, the different techniques you can use with them. So this is only a 60-minute talk. So this is me. I've written JavaScript since 1997, uh, CoffeeScript exclusively since 2011. That's an important piece of information I want to share with you guys. So I'm doing my best not to be biased, but I've written an awful lot of CoffeeScript, and I work with about nine other people who have also written a lot of CoffeeScript. And when I say a lot, meaning many very large applications with CoffeeScript. And uh, according to um, the rules of my company, I checked, I'm not allowed to say anything at all about what we do at ICE but we write an awful lot of coffee script for very important reasons that I can't go into. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I've never written TypeScript professionally. I feel like people get up in front of audiences and they say, I'm going to do a comparison between languages and don't confess that. I've never been paid to write TypeScript. Um, Java on and off, uh, approximately five years. The fact that I've worked in Java does inform me as to best practices and things like TypeScript uh, because I'm used to uh, strongly typesetically typed language. Um, I have been very fortunate, and I'm just going to risk termination by saying this. Um, we do at ICE on my project, uh, we are standardized on the latest Chrome for the application we're building, which is incredibly nice. Um, I don't have to worry about any other browser but the latest Chrome that comes out of Google. 
Uh, it's kind of like the best thing in the world. And so I get to use all of the latest ES features uh, right when they come out. Um, that's probably, in terms of job satisfaction, that's way up there. Um, dabbled in Ruby and Scala over the years. I am trying my best to learn Haskell and ClojureScript. I am not a quick learner, apparently. Those are, I probably shouldn't try to learn both of them simultaneously. Um, and generally, I'm, I'm tool language agnostic. I don't really identify myself by a language. I don't, I don't wear t-shirts that declare a language or a framework. Uh, I try to be very balanced about things. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I gave a talk on framework fanboys at DevNexus, which was a very balanced talk, I thought. But, you know, I, I try not to push my opinion too hard in any one way. We'll see how that goes. Is anybody stressed out by what I've said so far? Kitten, just in case. All right. So, for simplicity, I'm going to refer to JavaScript language versions prior to ES6 as JavaScript. So it's going to be a bit confusing, and you'll see in a second. Um, but when I say JavaScript, I mean versions older than ES6, which is ES5 and, and below. Okay, so this this is, uh, I think we can dim the lights, eh? Do you mind if we dim the lights? It'll make it easier to see uh, code samples later on. And let me know if I'm standing, let me just try to do this so I'm not blocking too, I'm sorry, I'm never going to. Be exactly out of your, your okay, there we go. Um, so this ends up being one of the most confusing parts about the talk. I will do my best. So, um, oh my god, I actually do have a laser pointer. I bought one, my wife packed me one as a joke, and I said, nobody uses laser pointers anymore, honey. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're going to say someone's using a laser pointer. Is it actually useful? Oh my god, it's useful. Okay, so... Uh, I've never done this. Okay, so this is sort of JavaScript before ES. Um, this is CoffeeScript, this is TypeScript. So they're all transpiled languages. So these languages are transpiled in JavaScript, TypeScript is transpiled into JavaScript. However, the conversation gets weird and confusing. So TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, which means that TypeScript gets to inherit the extensions added to JavaScript by ES6. CoffeeScript, because it is not a superset of JavaScript, it's basically a person who wrote the language who decides whether the features in ES6 should be added to CoffeeScript. Was that confusing? Good, everybody's with me, so let's keep going. So because ES6 isn't fully supported in all browsers, meaning the latest version of JavaScript, if I didn't make that clear, people didn't know. You can use Babel to transpile ES6 back into JavaScript for browsers who uh, do not support ES6 at the moment. Is everybody cool with that? Good. All right, let's keep it going. Now, we do crash course in languages. As someone who put this talk together, I found this next session very frustrating because there were lots of things I wanted to dwell on, but we got to keep it moving. Crash course in ES6. History, developed by blah, blah, blah in 1995. Netscape released it in 1996, JavaScript's an old language. Uh, this, it, it may not seem important that so Microsoft created JS, but really the fact that there were the browser wars at the height of the dot-com uh, boom back in the mid-90s, that led to the ECMAScript standard, that led to ES6. So it's, you have to go back in time to realize why is the situation so messed up? Why is JavaScript such a messed up language? If you, um, you know, and, and like, remember, I've, I've coded JavaScript since 1997, which means that I'm way beyond hating JavaScript. I've just, uh, you know, the stages of grief are now to the point where I accept JavaScript for what it is. And, you know, I make it, it's, it's allowed me to be employed for all these years, so I appreciate JavaScript. But it is a messed up language. And part of that is it's, uh, it was never intended to do the thing that we're asking it to do constantly. So uh, the ECMA International are the people who stepped in and said, this is madness, let's just standardize on something. And they haven't really done a fantastic job, frankly, but because browser vendors haven't listened to them until the last five-ish years or so. But generally speaking, they've said, uh, the sixth version is coming out, it's called the ES6, and long before they solidified what the actual specification is going to be, people like Google and Mozilla and, uh, and uh, Microsoft, they picked up the standards and they've been building to those, so that's awesome. So. ES6, there we go. JavaScript keywords, you should all be very familiar with these. Um, these are just the vanilla, 
you use JavaScript today, nothing special is what you get. When you're using ES6, you get a couple added to you. You get class, const, export, you can see what I'm saying. Uh, let me just make sure that nothing, everything is, the one thing that's not pretty obvious to you if you're not used to those types of languages is yield. Uh, import and export should have always have been there. Const should have always been there. Class should have always been there. Extend should have always been there. Um, let is uh, block level scoping. Super should have always been there. So people who've done a lot of JavaScript or programming in general would know that the fact that JavaScript didn't have this has always been sort of bizarre. So we talked about ES6 as being the next generation of JavaScript, but basically it's catching up to the mid-90s where it should have always been. Anyway, that's just my opinion, um, which will be a lot of this talk. ES6 features. So the language syntax and keywords and the features aren't exactly, uh, they're, you have to think of them differently. This sort of tripped me up. But really, this is what you care about when it comes to ES6. So arrow functions, uh, I won't read them all. Uh, I'll just call it the ones that are more interesting than others. Um, it's important to, uh, here we go. So generators work with the, you know, that's the yield keyword. That's very important, that's a big deal. Let and const, they should have always have been there. Default rest and spread, these are very helpful for doing things. Is everyone familiar with how that actual that language feature works? It's the dot, dot, dot syntax when you're soaking up the end of an array. Take my word for it. Um, again, that's an example of why this is a frustrating talk, because don't you want to just dive in, but I can't, I've got to keep it moving. Destructuring, very, very helpful for uh, taking an object and expanding it out to individual variables. Template strings should have arguably always been there. This is a weird feature, enhanced object literals. Um, I, uh, it's kind of one of those, why did you do that to yourself? But I won't dwell on that. Um, this sets, why didn't it have sets all along? Looking, 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 looking. Okay, good, that's fair enough. Again, I gotta keep this moving. But those are ESX features, everyone's calm now. All right, because list of keywords and features are a poor way to compare languages, we're going to look at the simple class implementation written in each language. Unless, of course, everybody wants to go through those last two slides for the next half hour. Right, exactly. So I picked a user class. Uh, who can read a UML? If you can't, this should be fairly obvious regardless. Just a simple class. It's got a, a property ID first name. It's got five uh, methods, three accessors, two, two mutators. That's all it is. It's the simplest thing in the world. It's only going to result in... You know, being able to do this in JavaScript. Everybody on the same page. Everybody good. All right. What we're going to do as we go through the section of the talk is we're going to look at what this simple user class, and everybody should be able to construct this class, no pun intended, in their minds right now in whatever programming language you're used to. Very simple class. You know how it would look. There's no surprises, nothing funky. So this is it in JavaScript, sort of traditional JavaScript. Uh, prototypical inheritance is what you have. So you sort of created a thing, everything is a function, so if you want to new something up later, you just find it as a function, then you add to its prototype. And this is basically how JavaScript has always worked, prototypical base inheritance, that's all you had. So you were able to use object-oriented programming in JavaScript all along, it's just that you had to use prototypical inheritance, you couldn't use the classical extends inheritance that we're all known and love. But this is, and by the way, for scale, uh, I've added this uh, the UML down here in the lower right-hand corner so that you can always be reminded as we go through these slides that we're only talking about exactly the same functionality. This is it in ES6. Uh, you'll notice that, and this is one of the things about ES6, it just looked like it was supposed to look, really. There's nothing about this that should be surprising. What was surprising is the way JavaScript used to do it. All right or used to do it, does it today without ES6. So for example, just to put it into perspective, if you want to start writing this type of code today, um, you can use Babel, uh, and it'll it will transpile to uh, you know, old JavaScript, so you can use an IE today, things like that. All right, bottom line. Various features support in various browsers. If you want to use ES6 features in all browsers, you can use Babel. Um, good, anybody stressed out? Excellent, let's keep it going. Crash course in TypeScript. First made public, then that guy created it. So, from the, is anybody here a like really huge fan of C Sharp? Really, really like C Sharp? You really like C Sharp? You really like C Sharp? All right, it's cool. So, she, she, C Sharp may or may not have been a ripoff of another language. 
I don't know. But it was. And it was Java. Java uh, is kind of one of those things where you see something horrible and you go, man, I want that. And so C became horrible. So when I saw this, I said, from the maker, from the guy who ripped off Java, TypeScript is ripping off C Sharp. That's why we have kittens in this talk, to keep everybody calm. But uh, when I saw this, I said, huh. Before I even looked at one line of TypeScript, and I looked at you know the blur of you know, Hacker News that comes across as you read it, you go, uh-uh. Uh, so I wonder what this is going to look like. Um, this third bullet point, so I doubt we're going to have a lot of CoffeeScript enthusiasts in the audience. Do we? Do we have any rabid CoffeeScript enthusiasts? No, okay. Um, the, uh, effectively, the thing that will rub CoffeeScript enthusiasts the wrong way, these are the people I work with, is this claim that it originated from the perceived shortcomings of JavaScript for the development of large-scale applications by both Microsoft and among their external customers. I've seen that phrase multiple times in multiple descriptions of TypeScript. Um, I am I'm struggling to remain neutral and not biased, but it is a curious statement to make. Um, superset of JavaScript, we've talked about that. These are the TypeScript features. Now, you'll notice that it's relatively short. TypeScript gives you this as well as the uh, ES6 features. So think of this slide plus all the ES6 slides as well, if that happens to be what you're, uh, you know, what you're going for. When I did a review of the slide, it seemed redundant, but hopefully you understand that this is additive to what you have there. Uh, type annotations is, of course, the big thing. Uh, public and private, always helpful. Uh, compile, this is... Compile time type checking is, of course, the point of TypeScript. Uh, and we will get into uh, what that gives you a lot later on. Uh, type inference, very nice. Thank you so much for not making us wait. How, how long did uh, Java, Java make us wait for that? Five versions? Six, I don't know. But thank you for not making us wait for that. I was very happy to see that. Interfaces, always handy. You know, it's always handy. Um, mix in, so I added it here. You can do mix ins by, in, uh, by convention, but. You know, let's give them credit for credit is due. At least they have that. Um, generics, uh, who's familiar with what generics are? Okay, so having, taking a language that's not typed, adding typing to it, and then giving it back generics, as well as one of the types that's built into TypeScript called uh, the same self, or any, any, that's the one, any, is a little bizarre and weird to me, but I do understand it. So, um, again, if I had more time, I would definitely dig into the purpose of generics and the any type in TypeScript, considering that it's trying to add typing to JavaScript. But I do know why they did it. So everybody has questions about that, I can explain. All right, so this is what TypeScript looks like. Um, the things to note, I'm loving my pointer. So we get to declare variables. It's kind of looking c sharp -y, java e, so that's good. Uh, type information comes afterwards, like the, a lot of languages you might be familiar with. Um, and uh, let's see if there's anything fancy here. Same type of information there. Other than that, it's just JavaScript. So a little bit more, more verbose, but you do get um, typing and compile time checking. Bottom line, <clears throat> if you like Java and C Sharp, you should like TypeScript. Um, uh, David's looking very hostile. He's, he's looking like he's about to throw something. David, are you about to throw something at me? No. All right, good. I, I can tell, though, you're thinking about it. Uh, if you hate looking at type information, you should not use TypeScript. Uh, for example, there's people who have a visceral anger when they look at uh, type information in Java. You should steer clear. Um, if you believe in compile time type checking, use TypeScript that includes you know, static typing and the, and the powers and benefits thereof. Um, if you have lots of problems with type-related bugs in JavaScript, use TypeScript. Very influential members of the JavaScript community have said many snarky remarks about this that I'm not, I, I decided I didn't want to, I didn't want to make my talk negative uh, to that end, but there's nasty opinions about that that I don't think are productive. Generally speaking, I believe that there are people that see value in catching type-related bugs at compile time, and I respect that, that those people exist. Um, if you are not going to make use of type annotations and type checking, just use ES6, because that's what TypeScript gives you beyond ES6, Babel, etc. All right, Crash Course in Coffee Script. Created by Jeremy. I just, let's call him, I, I think that's Ashkenis. Uh, so Jeremy Ashkenis, who also created Backbone and Underscore. Does anyone use Backbone and Underscore? Ha, ah, he did. Did you use Backbone and Underscore? Yeah. <laughs> that was not a raging endorsement. Um, 
first version released in on Christmas Eve, apparently. And this, uh, Gold Scrape, a language that takes out the frustrating and overly verbose bits of JavaScript and provides a safer, briefer way to stick to the good parts. So that, you should hold that in contrast to the TypeScript notion of we want to make it easier to build large-scale applications. So you can look at this sort of dueling perspective of, you know, I, I just want to make something simpler that makes it nicer to program in. The other person says, I want to scale out to large enterprises, large code bases. CoffeeScript features. Um, it pains me we can't spend more time on this, but let's just keep it going. Everything is an expression. There'll be examples of that I can call out later on in the talk. This is probably the big part. Uh, white space to delimit blocks of code. That, I think, uh, is one of the most hated parts among people who don't like CoffeeScript is the fact there are no braces, there are no friends. Da David's in the back going, no, that's terrible. But <laughs> I'm watching you, David. You need to go back to <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh, when when you when you get rid of the structure of the program and you're only relying on the fact that you remember to put two spaces or you know four spaces to control the flow of your program. If you're not used to it, and everyone's not used to it when they first do it, it is incredibly frustrating and it will lead to some very bizarre, strange bugs, including things like not having to include the return because the last line is always returned. That will also lead to strange and bizarre things. Um, optional parens, optional postfix. The if I were to spin through all of this, uh, I'll say something that my uh, mentor told me um, about PHP maybe ten plus years ago. He said there are many sharp knives in that toolbox with which to cut yourself. CoffeeScript is like that. You can write perfectly unintelligible CoffeeScript should you so desire. Uh, if you use it properly, in my opinion, it will be readable. But you be the judge. So this is the exact same class written in CoffeeScript. For the people who write CoffeeScript, this is why we write CoffeeScript, and I write CoffeeScript. Um, now, CoffeeScript bottom line. You made that longer than you needed to be. Which one? I, I was trying to be fair. And yes, yes. Are you, were you, talk about no question answer, but yes. But you do feel it's a fair, it's a fair fight. Fair fight? Good. It's a fa yes, it's a fair fight. There we go. Yeah, yeah, true. Granted, granted. It's fine. Uh, what? What did you say? The, um, <laughs> the <laughs> so the bottom line, if you want a little noise, and I put noise in quotes because there's some people who take air quotes noise and declare that it's really a thing, but again, later on the slide, I'll explain to you how that's really incredibly subjective itself. Um, uh, use CoffeeScript. You want to cut down noise, which you think is noise. Uh, if you like Haskell Ruby, you should like. Does anybody here write Haskell or no Haskell? It's supposed to Haskell. How about Ruby? You should. But if you've not, there we go. But if you've never seen them before and you've never used them, you've only used things like Java and C Sharp, then this will seem incredibly odd to you. This, to me and my colleagues, are is one of the, the worst parts about CoffeeScript is that Jeremy took an awful long time to add the ES6 yield keyword, which had us uh, frightened for about a year in there. And we realized that we were at this guy's whim to decide whether or not he should add uh, this capability there. So it's, it freaked us out, it got added, um, and we understand his rationale. He didn't just want a new jerk, just add things to the language that might clutter it up. Totally respect that, but it, it was, uh, it's one of the criticisms I hear a lot about CoffeeScript is, well, you know, there's a new feature just got released and we can't use it because it's not added to CoffeeScript. But ES6 is not um, Old questions until the end, but very good point. There we go. Just make fun of my, uh, my kittens. Um, all right, recap of code samples. So, JavaScript, ES6, TypeScript, CoffeeScript. Do that again. JavaScript, ES6, TypeScript, CoffeeScript. Now, I said fair fight. So there's lots of different ways I could have written all four of these to make one language seem superior to the next or inferior to the next. This was, uh, this was a bit, this was, and for such a simple class, um, it was uh, difficult to be fair and reasonable. It seems, I, I asked a lot of people, I said, does it, you know, I write CoffeeScript, was I 
sort of getting by choice of example, was I giving CoffeeScript a leg up? Was I trying to, you know, show off CoffeeScript? And the, the general impression was that no was a fair fight. So that, that was what I meant, is that it's an apples and apples, and that's also why the UML is there, to remind you that they all adhere to the same signature, the same new user, they would all uh, pass that test. Um, now, having said that, there's, uh, so like I said, all the guys I work with, they write CoffeeScript, but not all of them like it. And a lot of them say, you know, you know, really, Neil, it's time for us to switch to ES6, we don't need CoffeeScript anymore. And when they reviewed this, this slide, especially this one, uh, the direct quote from one of, one of the senior engineers I work with was, um, I, I want, and I, and I quote, um, I want to like ES6 so much, but that coffee script is so damn pretty, end quote. And he was one of the people who said, we really need to think about moving on. And, it was, and I, I think anybody who's very familiar with this argument will understand his sentiment you kind of want to go back to something standard, something that's fit for purpose, and what, you know, just have a lot of industry support. But when you look at, at code in this comparison, uh, the way the way I just did it here, it's very tough. Uh, it's very tough to go back, right? Basically hooked on a drug. As for TypeScript versus CoffeeScript, um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of pro CoffeeScripters here. If there were, I would be trying to settle them down. So it's it's a lot of what I'm going to be saying here is going to be in defense of TypeScript. Imagine that there's another set of people who are like down with TypeScript, all along with CoffeeScript. So if you just go, this is TypeScript, this is CoffeeScript. I do not think the, it's as simple as therefore CoffeeScript is better because it takes up less lines. It is that is not the end of the discussion, and the rest of the talk will continue with that. So. Key selection criteria. Wait, I have no kitten right now. All right, just bear with me. A kitten will come shortly. Key selection criteria. So you've, you've got these three. It's time for you to start making decisions. What do you look at? From my assessment, I came up with three categories that I think matter as you try to look at all three of these. Language features. TypeScript has many features for you to use. Here's a tour de force that's taken directly from their TypeScript uh, code base. It is, it might seem again like I'm, uh, I'm sort of creating something that's convoluted, but this is in their shader example. And this code, if the types were to be incorrect, would blow up. And it's a non-trivial uh, little example they put together. You can find it in you know, Google shader TypeScript. It's, uh, I respect the fact that in this particular code sample, uh, strong typing, very, very handy, very, very useful. I will not take that away. So if you're good, if you need that, TypeScript, if you like this, this is what you should go with. CoffeeScript has many features for you to use. And you might think this is a slide where I'm going to show gorgeous. Okay. So I tried to find the most unintelligible CoffeeScript I could so that I could show off the other side of the coin. Let's find something uh, wonderful here. So again, I read and write this all day. So let's see, volume 10, if band is its final tap. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going here. Is there anything here that's really freaking someone out? Just a quick question. They have no idea what a particular line does. The, uh, mm -hmm. the mine is something that's improving this mine personal. Yes, that is a sort of annoyingly uh, stupid ternary they set up now. Um, so return true if uh, mind is false and world is uh, not false, but it's not that simple because it's false. So it is a particularly, again, I've tried to find insidious lines of code, so it wasn't TypeScript bad, CoffeeScript good. I feel like that's pretty insidious. Um, having said that, uh, it, in the defense of people who write CoffeeScript, usually lines of code like that don't get through code reviews. If you do code reviews, I will talk about that later. ES6 has many features for you to use. So again, we're talking about language selection criteria, features. They all have features. There are some features. So I will humbly confess that I spent 30 minutes of my life uh, about last year sometime, in November I think it was, trying to understand this code and how it worked. Um, that is the longest I've ever spent on the shortest piece of code. Uh, this, it was almost like an interview uh, uh, question that I was failing, but I was by myself. and myself through it. 
I now believe I fully understand how the yield keyword in generator functions, that's what this uh, little star denotes. I do believe I think I know how it works, but this is a very powerful uh, ES6 feature that we do use, generators, yields, yieldables, if you know the code library or NPM, <coughs> very, very powerful, virtually unintelligible, and if there's a point I'm trying to make with these, these uh, slides, it's that, yes, language features, very powerful, but are they, you know, is that the end of it? You know, I want, a, I want a language with more features, I don't want to use a language that doesn't have a lot of features. They all have features. <laughs> understandability. So understandability, uh, it could be thought of as readability and expressiveness, but I believe readability and expressiveness are actually different, and I'm going to explain it. <clears throat> so let's talk about readability. I am a happy coder, written in English. Does anyone here speak German? Okay, so I can't read this out. Ich bin ein Glücklicher Coder, but I understand Coder because that I'm familiar with that word. <coughs> Dutch, ich bin ein Glücken Coder. I also know Coder, so I'm good. French, je suis un Codeur hier Berufs. So, but I do know that there's a code in there, so I'm I'm I'm, do, I'm keeping up so far. <laughs> Soy un codiferador feliz. I, there's a COD, so I'm pretty sure that means code. Uh, mm, yeah, I lost no, but that's okay. Anybody here speak Chinese? I don't see a computer screen. Okay, good. Is that, how was that say? Okay, good. Excellent. All right, we're on our way. So uh, here's my conclusion. The more familiar you are with the language, the easier it is to understand. I have an incredibly difficult time reading closure script. Uh, my brain isn't trained for it. It reads like gibbledygook to me, but I am trying to reprogram my brain to read things in a different order so I can comprehend that language. But I, I have faith that the more I practice reading it, the more I practice writing it, the better I'm going to get at it. Now then, for expressiveness, right, meaning do, uh, so how, how much do you convey the intent, if you will? I am a happy coder. Happy, the coder I am. Me happy with B coder. I'm a happy coder. I I am am a a happy happy coder coder, which is how a lot of people view uh, Java. By the way, he gets the joke. John Smith writes Java code, and as a result, feels the emotion of happiness. Very precise. I am, you see, someone who is in fact indubitably and unerringly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, someone who, in truth, does greatly enjoy, nay, is indeed happy being a coder. A bit verbose. Once when I was a boy, I dreamed of a life where I could be happy. Happy, that is, not just anything. No, I would have to, I'll just do that. The point I'm trying to make is that it's more about how you write it than it is the language that you're writing in. And I've been asked this. So what I'm, in my hopefully not clumsy attempt, I'm trying to say, it's not as simple as saying, uh, oh, well, it's hard, to, it's hard to read language. Are you familiar with it? Oh, well, that's hard to read code. Well, I don't know. How well written was it? Badly written code in any language is hard to understand. Bug prevention. Type scripts. Sorry, uh, the, I should have said scripts, sorry. Compile time type checking is thought to lead to fewer bugs, especially in larger code bases. This infuriated some of my friends and colleagues, but I think it's the claim. And I think it's a perfectly fine claim. So, this is a, can you see that? Yeah. This is a standard FizzBuzz. You got everyone familiar with that little programming? It's not Fibonacci FizzBuzz. Very simple. This is written in TypeScript. Uh, <coughs> This is a unit test, or rather an excerpt from a unit test, in TypeScript. Um, I promised myself that I would not uh, sort of take the talk in a weird direction, where I talk about unit testing versus compile time checking, so I will not. However, there are people who believe, because of its brevity, CoffeeScript reveals bugs more easily. This is FizzBuzz. Again, for 
the unconscious room. And these are the unit tests. All the code that you've just seen is equivalent. Here's my thought. My thought is as follows. I believe, and I'm speaking for myself, I am not speaking for other people, I'm just, this is my personal opinion, that all things being equal, in the examples we just saw, and I'll zip that really quick. Um, TypeScript, FizzBuzz, TypeScript, uh, uh, unit tests, CoffeeScript, FizzBuzz, CoffeeScript, FizzBuzz, unit tests. I would rather, at least the developers on my team, spend their time writing good unit tests with good coverage that makes good sense than worrying about uh, type hinting within their code. That is my opinion. Incidentally, I'm, I'm part of a team of several different developers, so unfortunately they have to listen to what I say and this is what I preach. So yes, we write CoffeeScript and we aggressively do code review and I'll talk about that uh, later on as well. But unit testing is the necessary compensation for a lack of static type checking, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like, uh, hey, you know, there's no harness, so be really careful when you're climbing. There's a part of me that wonders, and maybe 10 years from now, future Neil will know the answer to this. I wonder that because they don't have type check checking, they're paranoid such that they have to write unit tests. I don't know if that's true, but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, if I listen to this 10 years from now, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, was, is that a pipe dream? Is that true? I'm not sure. Making a decision. Fun part of the topic. Everyone, David seems not as upset with me as he was a couple slides ago. Excellent, David. It's going to be fine. Was that? That's right. I did not clearly have enough kittens. Uh, <laughs> I hate you. I want you to die. Um, so, so, making a decision. A little accent. The world stressful stuff is behind us. By the way, incidentally, how many people agree with me that was actually a stressful talk? Everything we just went. No? Wasn't it? It was like, no? Everyone's like, no. It was a stressful Depending on the room, like, if, yeah. I think you hear too much about that. Yeah. Look at that. Thank you, sir. That I, think, too, I will I will take that as a compliment, damn it. Regardless of how who was a compliment. Well, I do care what the people think. Picking something based on features. I'm I'm I hope I get there. I want to get there. <laughs> um picking something based on features. This is a first generation iPhone. And it is awesome. When I first got my iPhone back in the day, it could do uh, my most used features. By the way, the section we're in is, you know, picking something based on features. My most used features were apps, awesome. Taking pictures, awesome. Checking email from anywhere, awesome. Browsing internet, text messaging, making phone calls, all with this little device. And it was incredible. And I bought it for the features because before then I had a little Nokia that couldn't do anything but send those little text messages. And, and that was fantastic. That would have been 2005-ish or something like that. It was amazing. Recently, I bought the iPhone 6. And it was amazing, too, because it was more bigger, more thinner, more better camera, more faster processor, more sensors, more better keyboard, and Apple Pay. So I was like, i got to get me one of these. And today, my most used features are apps, taking pictures, <laughs> checking emails, browsing the internet, and text messaging, and making phone calls. So the lesson there is, what's that? I do not speak to you quite a bit. <laughs> but I wouldn't have made for a good slide. Um, so, uh, the, the, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, the, so what I'm trying to say is that when you go, oh yeah, we're totally using characters. We're gonna be using all these advanced language features. Be honest with yourself, are you really? Uh, has anyone here, does anybody code Java and have for the last 10 years or so in the room? Yes, that's right, Ned, you have, yes. So Java, you know, pretty steadily every couple of years, we keep adding uh, language features. In version 5, they added a ton of features. And from my perspective, the people who were using Java 5 weren't taking advantage of Java 5 features because they just never learned how to write Java 5. So they were just writing Java 5 code just like Java 1 code because they kind of never moved on. So if you know you're the type of person who's not going to take advantage of new features, be honest with yourself. Don't overemphasize language features you're never going to use. 
um, the yieldable uh, you know, yields generators, I'm going to abuse the hell out of that in ES6. And there's code that is earmarked already for being refactored into it. So I'm going to use it. So that's why I'm uh, excited about ES6. Huh. So I'm not really sure how that's going to all pan out. Um, <laughs> but, but we'll see. But it's very cool. And uh, I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll see. 18 hour power <laughs> That's, uh, who's going who's to get an Apple Watch? Be honest. All right, yeah, you, 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 there we go. Lady in the back. Yes, Apple Watch. Um, I, I, I don't want to be seen as one of those people who got the Apple Watch just because I wanted one, but I do. So I think I'm going to buy one and keep it in my pocket. <laughs> Okay, giving context to understandability. So second, we're making a decision here. Um, so, let's take a very potentially maybe kind of real made up society, uh, situation. There is a suspicious vehicle parked out front of this lady's house. It's a very serious situation. She calls her dad. She says, Dad, there's a weird van in front of my house. Dad, very concerned, calls a police officer. And Dad says, Officer, my daughter has a weird van in front of her house. She lives at 7890 Chesapeake Lane. The officer then calls the 911 operator and says, Dot, 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 I don't know what the police officers say when they're starting conversations, but I imagine there's a point that goes, Van is a 1996 year Plymouth Green minivan with gray lower trim parked in front of 9890 Chesapeake Lane. What I'm attempting to demonstrate here is that depending upon the context of who you're speaking to, more information may be appropriate versus less. If she is speaking to her father, she does not need to articulate the qualities of the van. She does not need to articulate where she is. The context exists. There's no reason for you to say, I live dad, there is a green van of these portions and years and what have you, who lives at this address? Dad would say, honey, are you hysterical? I know where you live because I'm your dad. At the same time, when the dad calls a police officer, he's saying, look, I'm just telling you what my daughter told me. There's a weird van in front, but I can add extra information for clarity. What I'm attempting to do is show that by adding information, you can improve clarity. So it's very easy to say, oh, you should remove, 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 that improve clarity. But additive, it works the same way if it's appropriate information for your audience. So this is analogous to how I work with my team of problem scripters. We sit very close together. We've worked together for many years now. We, our code reviews now are so idiosyncratic. Sometimes we just look at the code and discuss theory of why this code can't be improved anymore. That was today that we wanted, is that this is the maximum we can make this code. Why is that? And it's just because we've worked together for a long time. We all have the same general standards. You cannot, I was very proud of this achievement, if you pull up any file uh, on my team, it all looks the same. There's no individual coding style because I've beaten it all out of them. It's all incredibly consistent. When, uh, for example, I was programming with uh, someone else's API, and I just knew. I just knew what the method call would be. I didn't even look for it. I knew it would be something like get product template. I just knew it would be because I've been working for him so long. I, we had a conversation about product templates. He said, hey, yeah, I'm going to add an accessor for you on the so-and-so service. And I said, all right, whatever. And then when I got there, I was just like, what do you call it? Eh, you should probably call it get product template. Ah, I just added it in and ran it, and it worked. That is a very close-knit dev team. I don't need a lot of typing information to communicate and clarify things to him. Having said that, Ed and I happened to work for a different company many years ago, and that culture was very different. Everyone was very distributed. There was a huge turnover rate, a lot of contractors, so people would be coming in and leaving kind of on a monthly basis. There was no set development culture. It was all very tactical. It was all very, I have a bug. I need to get this bug into production fixed. There was no, um, there was no common language, there's no common theme, and I maintain that if not for the fact that everyone was using Java, nothing would have ever gotten done because Java acted as a contract between me and people I don't know, and 
let's be honest, I don't really trust what they're doing. But I do know they couldn't even have compiled the code uh, and, you know, checked it in until it got to me. So depending on your situation, you know, in this situation like this, you know, you don't, maybe you don't need typing. If you're in a situation like this, you, you may very well need typing to aid in communication. That's not the best part about typing. Mm. <sighs> Bug prevention. We talked about this earlier. It's an important part of it. Proper prioritization of bug prevention. Are all bugs created equal? So most of the times when we think about bugs, it really isn't tangible to us as developers, the consequence of a bug. So it's easy to stand there and say, I don't need stuff. Typing, why would I need that? I'm, I'll just write unit test, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, what's the worst that can happen? And I thought, well, because I, I you know, I, I coach a team of developers, and so I have to, it, you know, when there's new developers or working with new people, I, I have to have this discussion with them. Uh, what is the price of a bug, and how much do you care if a bug is created? And I thought, how can I really convey why you should be concerned about preventing bugs? Not finding and fixing bugs, that's different. Preventing bugs. So this is a Nimitz class supercarrier. Uh, that's expensive. That is an F-35. That's also expensive. However, it's hard to imagine just how expensive they are. So I made a little diagram. So that there, where's my pointer? So that is a standard pallet that you use to lift things. Those are uh, stacks of $100 bills. Um, that is $100 million to give you a visual of what that is. Times 1.48 equals the cost of one F-35 jet plane. But wait, this is $100 billion, sorry, $1 billion, times 13 equals an aircraft carrier. And you're saying, why is that important? Okay, your job as a software developer is to make sure that the flight control software in all of these systems lands that $148 million plane on that $13 billion uh, ship. So I don't know about you guys, but that puts a lump in my throat. I'm not ready to say, I don't need static typing. I'll be fine. I'll just use unit tests. I don't need any type of checks or safeties. I'm cool. I'm like Mark Zuckerberg. I can just code anything and I'll become a billionaire and buy one myself. So this is my thought of what would happen if uh, a bug was found. My thought is that someone would come to you, your boss, your boss's boss, in a military escort and put you on a helicopter and fly you out somewhere in the mid-Atlantic with the software upgrade handcuffed to your wrist, at which point very impatient, scary people with guns are going to watch you as you carefully install the software to fix the bug. So, in my opinion, one bug equals your ass. So, when you think about bug prevention, not bug fixing, you shouldn't poo-poo away static type checking like TypeScript. You should uh, understand the context of it. If you're Mark Zuckerberg and you're hacking away PHP, because one day you're going to be you know, one of the wealthiest people on Earth, maybe you need static check type checking. If you are trying to uh, land a very expensive aircraft or a very expensive ship, maybe you should care. My advice. Here we go. Use TypeScript if you love Java and C Sharp and hate JavaScript. I think that's a reasonable statement. Um, use Microsoft Visual Studio and generally like IDE, IDE or generally like IDE factory support. Um, <coughs> a lot of C Sharpers in this room, I assume, do you use a lot of IDE based refactoring? Yes? Yes? Okay. Good? Good? So. Sorry, speak is still in my brain. I'm speaking to a, a, a general audience. Um, so the or generally like IDE for, for so you can use IntelliJ as well and get comparable uh, to when it comes to um, IDE support. Frankly, a lot of the guys I work with don't use IDEs at all. So things like refactoring support don't, don't register with them at all. 
But if you've ever coded a hateful language like Java, which I have, uh, you end up letting the IDE write the code for you and do the refactoring for you, which is wonderful and blissful and enjoyable. And often when someone is complaining to me about Java because of their terse little copy script, I say, you know, back in the day when I would write Java, you would just let the IDE rename the signature of this particular class and it would just trickle everywhere and you wouldn't have to think about it. So uh, get to Greppin. Uh, <clears throat> you find yourself doing a lot of instance of type of, that was a spell check mess up there, I'm supposed to one word, type of guards in your JavaScript event bug. So basically, you know, to make sure that you don't have a bug in your program, you're guarding, you know, when the method, the arguments come in, you're saying, Type of, instance of, type of, instance of, just use TypeScript, you might as well. Um, you know that your bug should be caught by type checking, fine. Uh, so, how do you phrase that last bullet point? You have a large, divergently skilled team who don't have the opportunity to meld just together on a code conventions. Right? You, you, if you have a hundred monkeys throwing code against a wall, it's good to have some structure <laughs> to make sure that things don't get too far out of control. Use TypeScript if you love Haskell, Ruby, and hate JavaScript, analogous to uh, Java and C. You believe that brevity leads to fewer bugs than verbosity. It's a belief. You hate looking at noise, again, an air quote, uh, in your code. And by the way, I think there's a significant difference when, if I were to leave out the quotes. Because when I say, quote, noise, I say it's an opinion, right? But your opinion is that that's adding noise to your code, as opposed to clarity. See earlier example of the police officer and the father and whatnot. You're going to take advantage of CoffeeScript language features. There's virtually no point in using CoffeeScript if you're just going to write it like you were writing JavaScript. If you're going to use CoffeeScript, go all in, use expressions, get used to reading it. It will, uh, if you join a team like our team, there are things that you will just have to train your eye to. And uh, if you're just not familiar with it, you'll go, this is unintelligible. Like, no, obviously that's going to return at the end of the map. You know, unless you're used to reading, it'll make no sense. <clears> hey, <throat> yeah, you trust the German and keep his language up to date uh, with ESX features. Um, that's a bit upsetting. Wait a minute, did I take out... Oh, I took out a particular slide, I thought, a, a bullet point that I thought was there. Um, that's weird. So I, in an earlier version, I had a bullet that said, if you want the power and strength of Microsoft behind your language, which I think is a good thing. Because the bullet was in contrast to, you trust that Jeremy will keep his language up to date with the ESX feature. I have a lot of confidence that Microsoft is going to take care of TypeScript. I don't think it's, I don't, you know, Jeremy currently is working as a designer, I think, at the New York Times. I don't know how much time Jeremy is spending worrying about updating his language with language features. That's a concern of mine. But it is so pretty. I can't, I can't stop writing it. Yes, and uh, enter long, angry debates that I uh, have with my team about working off of a fork. I have no problem working off of a fork, but yes. Uh, for example, the great yield fork fight of 2014. Um, <laughs> so, oh, ES6. <laughs> that was a bad one. I remember that one. Lots of people died. Uh, use ES6 if you love JavaScript. You don't want to use the type checking in TypeScript. And honestly, you just say, I want to use TypeScript, but I don't want to use the type checking. What's the, what's the point? That's the whole point of the, the thing. That's why you're doing it. Uh, you don't ever want to miss out on features because they're not added to CoffeeScript. It's good. You want to be part of the largest development community rather than a subset. ES6 will end up being, over time, the largest development community. TypeScript and CoffeeScript will always be relegated to some subset of the larger JavaScript ecosystem. Whoo! That was rough. That was a rough talk. All right, questions?